Up next is Heidi Waldrop, and this is a presentation is a project from USDA and Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania and Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome. Thank Heidi. you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's see. We've got this doohickey, and do you know yeah. which one which works which? Um, yeah, this one should advance you. Okay. So right and left, and then that should be the point at the top. Okay, thank you so much. So we're switching gears a little bit. We're going to talk about nitrous oxide emissions from open lot cattle systems, and this includes beef cattle feed yards and dairies. And this work was part of a, um, a large scale sustainability review that was funded by the Beef Checkoff for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And this study has been published in the Journal of Environmental Quality, so it's a couple months old now. So basically what we're going to go over is what we know about feed yard nitrous oxide. What is nitrous oxide? Where is it produced? How is it produced? How much is produced in these open lot systems? And what sort of mitigation methods are available to deal with this? So I'm sure you guys all know this. This is just your basic what is nitrous oxide? So it's a greenhouse gas with a 100-year global warming potential, uh, about 300 times that of CO2, and a lifetime of 115 years. Um, uh, it's estimated that about 60% of anthropogenic nitrous oxide comes from agriculture, but most of that is coming from fertilized cropland. It's not coming from our manure. Um, in 2015, livestock manure contributed about 17 teragrams CO2 equivalents, and beef cattle contributed about 8 teragrams of that 17. So this is what it looks like if you map it out. Um, so we've got our U.S. livestock sectors, and you see that cattle, both beef and dairy, uh, are a major source of nitrous oxide, much more so than any of these other species, even though we may have more poultry and swine. So most of our work is done on beef cattle feed yards. We're in the Texas Panhandle, where 42% of our finished beef is originating. But what most people don't know is this area is getting a huge influx of these big open lot feed yards, or dairies, and they're very similar to feed yards in a lot of ways. There's some dissimilarities, but there's also a lot of similarities. The animals are housed in these big pens where the manure is allowed to accumulate. Um, they have some shade awnings. They have um, flush alleys. And the thing that makes them really similar is this manure, it's a dynamic substrate. It's, <coughs> there's lots of microbes in there. It's continually decomposing, fermenting, and changing. And it's directly impacted by the weather. The heat is going to increase the microbial reactions. Water is going to increase microbial reactions. And so this is quite a different animal than when we're looking at something in a livestock barn. So I, I mentioned the increase, and this is the change in U.S. milk production from 2001 and 2011, and where the green areas are the ones where the big dairies are coming in, and we're talking dairies with about 3,000 cows. And so they're, they're large, very intensive dairies with usually no grazing. So what we have here is a comparison. This is an aerial view of an open lot dairy as well as a beef feedlot. We have the pens. We have, here we have milking parlors. We have manure storages. And it looks very similar to a beef feedlot where there's our retention pond and our animal housing. Um, some of the similarities, I'll go ahead and put this all up. We've got um, differences in stocking density differences in manure management in terms of how often it's removed, differences in the product that's being harvested, and one of the big differences is the nitrogen intake. So in the dairies we get about 1.55 pounds per animal, whereas in the feedlots it's 0.36 pounds per animal on average. So they're different, but they're similar in a lot of ways. So how is this nitrous oxide being produced? We know from studies on soil that there's a gajillion ways nitrous oxide can be produced, and there's a lot of different reactions that are involved with it. But we also think that 
most of the manure nitrous oxide is produced by either nitrification, where ammonium is converted into nitrate and you get nitrous oxide emitted <coughs> as a byproduct, or denitrification, where nitrate is converted to dinitrogen gas and nitrous oxide is um, emitted as a byproduct as well. And um, the difference between these two reactions, the primary one, is this one occurs under aerobic conditions. So when our manure is dry, then we get an aerobic reaction that tends to predominate versus denitrification, which occurs in largely anaerobic or oxygen limiting um, conditions. And so this is going to make a difference. Um, currently, there's been really limited research on what is producing this nitrous oxide from open lot systems. And that's something we really want to get at. So there's some ways to do it, looking at enzyme activities, looking at the genes involved. And that's something we're going to be looking at pretty soon in terms of figuring out who's making it, because it's going to be hard to mitigate something if we don't know what's causing it. So this is what our manure pack is going to look like on a feed yard surface. So these are soil surface pens. And so the cattle are in there for about six months or so. And over time, this manure is going to accumulate. And so we get this impermeable manure soil interface where you get very little leaching going into the underlying soil. And that's overlied by what we call a wet pack, followed by a dry pack. And it's topped with a layer of loose, fluffy surface manure, which is very aerobic. And you can see that the, the layers differ in water content, this is obviously wetter and would be a good place for denitrification to occur, and it gets drier as you go up. But what we don't know is how permeable is this stuff. Typically when we sample it, it takes a pickaxe to sample it. It's like a rock. So I, I'm not sure how much we are getting. Some of our pre preliminary studies show that most nitrous oxide is coming from this loose, fluffy stuff on the top which is, is pretty dry, 7 to 13 percent water. So that would be a nitrification <coughs> reaction. Um, one thing about these feed yards is they tend to be highly variable in terms of spatial variability. We've got areas where the animals congregate around the, the feed bunks. There's going to be more manure there. We have wet areas. There's been some debate over whether these are actually wet areas or they're mounds. I'm going to call them wet areas. We're going to pretend they're wet right now. But so there's um, emissions, say, from this dry spot are going to be a lot different than emissions from this supposedly wet spot. In addition to the spatial variability in a pen or in a feed yard, we have temporal variability. There may be times when it's dry and warm. There may be times when it's really, really muddy and gross. And it may be cold and wet. And that's also going to affect what sort of reactions we have going on. So how do we measure nitrous oxide? Most often, we're measuring nitrous oxide with these non-flow through, non-steady state chambers. And these are just chambers about that big that you insert into the manure, um, about that deep. And they um, stay in place. You typically use a pen that's not occupied. And you cap them for a short period of time every day and then take samples say every 10 minutes so that you can calculate a flux rate and these are good for some ways and bad in some ways as well because given that they're small and given that we have a lot of variability we need a lot of them all over the feed yard pen to get good numbers because they tend to be highly variable also it's really hard to insert this chamber into that dense manure pack without fracturing it and disrupting the manure surface and you also get differences inside the chamber itself, which could generate hot spots of denitrification or nitrification activity. You can get humidity build up, and if it happens to rain, you'll get them to flood. And so that can be a problem. <coughs> but they are really good if you want to do something like looking at the effects of manure characteristics on emissions, or if you want to look at small pilot scale mitigation practices like adding some sort of chemical inhibitor, then these are good for that sort of thing. 
Um, uh, another way of, of measuring this is with a micromet method. This is an eddy covariance system. And to be honest, this has been really infrequently used in food yards. It's been underutilized. Some of the issues with this um, is that it's really expensive and it takes a lot of technical expertise. So most folks don't have those, whereas these are pretty cheap and, and don't require a lot of know-how to do. Um, and the big systems give you emissions over a large area, you know, typically a, a hectare or so. So you don't get emissions from a point, a specific point, so you can't know exactly what is causing those emissions, and also you get a lot of dilution because these emissions are usually barely detectable over back frame. Um, this is another system that we have yet to really try. This is basically it's a large chamber. This edge, it's got a sharpened edge, and so you're able to not really insert it into the manure, but at least you form a decent seal. And this is connected to a real-time nitrous oxide monitor. And so you can actually go into occupied pens and take some emissions at different points in a pen. This is our newest system. And I'm going to come back here because I can see this. And this was developed by David Parker. And it's actually really cool because what he's got are some big lysimeters. He has six of them. And he's filled them with manure. He's got a, um, this is a, a gantry with a rain scale. So he can measure water loss. And he fills them with manure. And so then we have a, a lid that goes on. And you can sequentially measure nitrous oxide emissions from each pan. <coughs> and it, that's also connected to a real time monitor. So you can get really fast, highly accurate data with this. And we just came out with the first papers on this, this system. And so this is what some of the data from the system looked like. What Dr. Parker did is he added manure at different rates, ranging from zero millimeters to 50 millimeters water to each of these chambers, and looked at emissions over the course of 45 days. And what he saw is that that first day that he added water, you got this huge spike of emissions. It's about 300 <coughs> milligrams per square meter per hour. And just boom, it went off. And so we think that's caused by extracellular enzymes. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with microbial activity. It's just an extracellular thing. Um, and it differed depending on the water content. You get the second peak that occurred about two weeks after water emission. And the higher the water content, the more nitrous oxide you got. This peak was not as high, up here you can see what it looks like. Um, but it was significant. And that's this is the first real data that we've gotten with this. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, this is the repeatability of the system. Basically, you just took the lid on and off for 60 seconds, 10 times. And that's what it looks like. Um, so this is just some of data about the measure of nitrous oxide from open lots. And you can see it's all over the map in terms of numbers as well in terms of methods. So it's, it makes it really hard to come up with some sort of decent evaluation about what, what are the real numbers for nitrous oxide from open lot systems. I sort of kind of standardized it and compared Emission factors, models, chamber methods versus micromet methods in terms on a per capita basis, which is grams of nitrous oxide per animal per day. And it's pretty clear that these chamber methods grossly underestimate, and these micromet methods probably are overestimated. And so that's that's an issue. We really need a little bit more of a standardized method to, to compare studies. I'm going to skip over this, well, just real quick. It's just the, um, this is what nitrous oxide emissions look like on a single day um, on a Chinese dairy. This was with a micromet method. And it's related to temperature. All right, so this is, I'm going to skip over the model and stuff because I'm running out of time. 
Um, we have developed a couple of models, and this was based on chamber studies, where we were able to, we had measured emissions and we predicted emissions, and we were able to predict emissions as a function of water content, temperature, and nitrate content, or as a function of this plus dissolved organic carbon content and some UV visible indices of organic matter stability. And these were negatively correlated with the thought being that the more stable the organic matter is, the less likely it is to be a substrate for microbial growth. And we were able to improve the prediction capability of these models. The red are the model and the black are the observed. And it, they were about 50 to 62 percent accurate with these models, and um, it still needs a little bit of refinement, but it's a, a step. And this is some IFSM modeling of open lot nitrous oxide, and this was done by Dr. Rotz. And what he saw that IFSM was able to model open lot nitrous oxide, this is the dairy, um, with 80 percent accuracy. Um, just some in Mitigation methods are basically you have your animal method or a pen management. So you can anything that you can do to improve animal productivity by implants or antibiotics, that sort of thing, or pen management by managing water content or adding some sort of chemical amendment, as well as like biochar and other things like that. But this really hasn't been researched too well. And that's something we really need to get into. So, um, in conclusion, the nitrous oxide flux rates that we saw in the literature range from 0.02 to 37 grams per animal per day, and 0 to 41 milligrams of nitrous oxide per meter square per square meter per hour. And this difference was due to the measurement method, management, as well as spatial and temporal variation. These emissions are largely controlled by temperature, manure nitrogen, and manure water content. And there are quite a few areas for further research, and we're looking into all of these. We need more accurate nitrous oxide measurements using the appropriate method. We need a better understanding of the biochemistry of this manure, what's producing this nitrous oxide, as well as a quantitative understanding of the specific factors, such as temperature, water content, that do affect this nitrous oxide. And we need to develop some cost-effective, excuse me, mitigation methods in order to maybe meet regulatory requirements if that ever happens. And we need to work with modelers to improve our process-based models so that we adequately, we are adequately representing the system. And with that, that's all I have. We have time for a couple of questions, if you'd like. Any? No questions? Okay. Uh, uh, for, uh, There's one. <laughs> I guess uh, I figured that was a way. Thank you. But, uh, so I'm trying to mind more injection uh, endeavors of looking at N2O emissions. I saw some a study where two weeks after manure injection, they saw a spike mm -hmm. in in gas release and right. it coincided with your two week peak on that one graph and it just clicked that maybe there's something there with, with the microbial right population uh, getting cranked up in a two week period to release that uh, through the denitrification That's process. what we think as well. We think that you know the addition of the manure right off the bat you're going to have your extracellular then it takes some time to get those populations stabilized and working and, and then you'll get your after you get your mineralization, then you start getting your nitrification, denitrification from the microbial sources. Yeah, just it just seems like a coincidence in yeah. different settings. And I want one other question. Yeah. The drill easy answer. How deep are those packed at the four layers? It varies. You can't really say. Um, you know, some areas you'll see the soil. Some areas it may be this deep. It's you can't really put a specific value on it. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.